and you was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was another that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. And welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk. You're on TV, we're on radio, we're online, and of course, we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, rescuers continue to search the Patapsco River for missing people after a ship destroyed the Baltimore Bridge. Russia's security chief accuses Britain of being behind the Moscow concert terror attack as the Kremlin extends the sentence of journalist Evan Gershkovich. Plus, the UK border force is slammed for demeaning treatment of two Israeli men who were due to speak about their ordeal at the October the 7th festival. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here at Talk TV. It's all kicking off tonight on the show, and we've got plenty of action for you. We're over in America for the very latest on that unbelievable bridge collapse in Baltimore early this morning. We're back in Downing Street as Rishi Sunak loses two more cabinet ministers in one day. We're on Easter watch with the Archbishop of Canterbury, will he mention it? And we're getting inside Alan Titchmarsh's jeans. You won't believe what we've found. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Do not move a muscle. Coming up, this is, of course, uh, the situation that we are bringing you after the breaking news this morning about that terrible bridge collapse. Emergency services are still tirelessly searching for six missing people in Baltimore. A cargo ship collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the very early hours of this morning. The city has declared a state of emergency as divers have been scouring the freezing water in the hope of finding survivors. Thankfully, two people have been successfully rescued and taken to hospital for treatment. But how the ship managed to collide with the bridge remains pretty unclear. The reports now suggest the ship lost power and sent a mayday call just moments before the actual crash. I'm now joined by commercial shipping expert, Captain John Noble. John, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Yep. I mean, I think we all Good awoke evening. this morning to, to some quite unbelievable scenes. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a bridge collapse like that. And I've seen um, what happened in the San Francisco earthquake in 1989. Um, you've never no. seen anything really like that, a bridge collapsing into the sea. Horrendous. And I suppose the only thing I could say is that it's a miracle that, that so few people were on it. I think that's absolutely right. Unfortunately, the mayday the ship sent seems to have alerted the authorities who stopped traffic going on to the bridge. Yes. Otherwise, it would have been a lot worse. Yes, exactly right. And I've heard various different experts talking through the course of today about how um, those bridges, that type of bridge, the way it's constructed, um, is quite precarious in the way that it's balanced and that it's not particularly strong if something slams into it. Um, but it's a pretty unusual state of affairs, is it not, for a ship of this size to just lose power altogether? Well, it, it is uh, very rare indeed, but not unknown, unfortunately. Uh, this ship seems to have lost its power just at the wrong time during its passage out. Yes. And, I mean, um, obviously there will be people investigating exactly what happened and how it could yeah. have happened, but tell us a little bit more about the bridge itself, if, if, if you can, in terms of, you know, what would have been its weak points, and as we see it collapsing there, I mean, I, I think most people who travel across bridges, and I've been to Baltimore many times, you don't expect to see that, really. No, it's, it seems to be, well, by modern standards, an unusual construction. Uh, if you look, for example, at the Forth Road bridges in yes. the River Forth, they have substantial structure at the sea level, so that if a ship were to go into it, it would hit the concrete protection uh, material before actually hitting the bridge. Right. And that there doesn't seem to be with this bridge any such protection to the structure of the bridge. Yes. 
And so, I mean, questions are already being asked about the possibility of inadequate maintenance, um, the fact that it may have been designed badly, it may have been produced cheaply. I mean, as I say, I mean, I know that, that area quite well. I used to drive up and down I-95 from New York to Washington a fair deal. Yeah. Um, and there's an awful lot of road bridges uh, and an awful lot of rail bridges as well in, in that because of the, the sort of the, the way the coastline yeah. sort of meanders down, down from north to south. Um, and it does seem, does it not, um, that there will be questions asked of the designers apart from anything else. And if there are any other bridges designed like this, you know, where are they? Well, I'm sure you're absolutely right in the sense that this will not be a unique design. It's uh, known bridges in the United States. Many of them are of a similar construction. And this bridge was clearly constructed, in my view, without the proper defence uh, mechanism at the base of the bridge. So that if a ship was going to hit anything, it would hit the defence of the bridge, not the bridge itself. Yes, and I understand it was built in 1977. Um, and obviously this is now uh, a good deal later in, uh, uh, in maritime the senses yeah. as well as everything else. Ships are now bigger, ports are probably busier. Um, is it something that is policed around the world in terms of the way that shipping and, uh, and, and waterways are policed? I mean, do you get regular checks on places like Baltimore as a busy uh, shipping terminal uh, to make sure that it's still well, suitable for what it's supposed to do? Well, this would be a matter for each local authority. Local authority. <laughs> different ports have different standards. Right. And uh, to be honest, I don't know how the Baltimore area is, is governed by the US Coast Guard and the local authorities. Mm. But in general terms, take Singapore, for example. That port is strictly controlled by the Singapore Port Authority and traffic right. management. Here. Yes. It is an extraordinary state of affairs. I mean, looking at the pictures sort of after the event, it seems as though the ship is, is almost bigger than the bridge. I mean, I know that's probably an optical illusion, but the size of these ships now, which are being sort of, you know, sent around the world and carrying some incredibly heavy materials, I mean, it must be a force to be reckoned with if it hits anything. Absolutely. I mean, uh, this, by modern standards, was not a very big container ship. It was 300 metres. Uh, here in Southampton, we get the biggest container ships coming in, which are just under 400 metres, yeah. and they are 150-odd thousand tonnes. So, and I see them every day as I mm. drive past. These are enormous structures. The one that hit the bridge was a few years old, so it was a previous generation. Yeah. But it's still a big ship. Absolutely right. And in general, I mean, I remember uh, doing stories on the fourth bridge, the road bridge, which was showing signs of deterioration simply because oh, the suspension yeah. part of it was kind of um, eroding effectively and they had to yeah. re-strengthen that and they had to sort of somehow blow air into it to make it better. I mean, bridges inevitably are not going to last forever, are they? No, of course not. And I, I'm well aware of the fourth road bridge that, that you're talking about. It was being built while I was at school in the area. And there, was, there were concerns then about the long levity of the bridge and modern uh, bridge maintenance yeah. techniques have picked that out. So bridges are, particularly over water, are very susceptible to uh, meteorological conditions in the form of rust. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, Captain John, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Captain John Noble there, a maritime Thank salvage you. expert. And as I say, the thing that I think all of us probably feel at this moment is it's how incredible that so few people were involved um, in this terrible disaster, which could have been so much worse. I'm joined now by Emma Wolf. Emma, thank you so much for, for, for joining us on the Independent Republic. Good to see you. Um, I think... I was just saying to John there, we all kind of woke up this morning and just thought, oh, my God, yeah. I've never seen anything like it. It's almost like somebody's filmed it for a movie and it's not real. I mean, I've never seen a bridge collapse in that way before. It almost looked like the bridge. The footage was absolutely astonishing. Yeah. And it looked like the bridge was made from matchsticks. Yeah. And obviously, close up, you see it's a huge structure. Right. But it looked just... It's sort of just toppled into the sea. Yeah. I mean, I think what I was feeling was actually... It's amazing this stuff doesn't happen more often. It yeah. really stops you in its tracks when it does. But these kind of man-made stroke natural event disasters, mm. 
why are they not, you know, I mean, really, it's so frightening. And when you look up, I mean, you mentioned the fourth bridge there. Yeah. I don't know if you know Hammersmith Bridge in London. Yeah, I do. Which has literally, I mean, if you look too close at that bridge, you would never cross it again. Right. OK, it doesn't carry the amount of cargo You can't and go across it anymore, can you? Apart, no, exactly. Apart. But, I mean, how long they've been trying to patch it up mm. and put bits back together. Yeah. Um, it really is frightening. And, and as you say, how amazing that there wasn't more loss of life yeah. on this. Well, the thing that worries me slightly is, is, I mean, I don't do it so much anymore, but I used to drive that, that route an awful lot from mm. New York down to, to Washington, D.C. Yeah. And there are road bridges constantly crossing All over, the, uh, you know, Maryland, Delaware, you know, as you get into Virginia, because, you know, it's a very, you know, sort of... Bridgy... Dodgy coastline. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. go in a straight line. And, I mean, I wonder how many other bridges there are. I mean, he was just saying there that the Baltimore authorities would be responsible for mm. maintaining that bridge. But, inevitably, bridges get old, like the fourth bridge, as I say. And Hammersmith Bridge, with time, they just get worn out. And you know, I'm now... I'm about to go to America tomorrow. and I'll be getting off at JFK Airport. I'll be taking um, what is now called the JFK, uh, JF, RF Kennedy Bridge, yeah. which connects um, sort of yeah, Manhattan... Yeah. And, and the Bronx to Long Island. Yeah. And that's a very high, tall bridge. And I'll very be going, high, very tall I hope we get across this quick. I'll be telling the guy to put his foot down. Because it's human nature, isn't it? I know, and we don't know anything about bridge maintenance. No, but nothing. But clearly, this is absolutely crucial. And so much of it is underwater. I mean, I, I know this is not the same, but I was cycling over London Bridge tonight yeah. to come here, and I was looking over at Tower Bridge, which, again, looks beautiful, but yeah. as this does. I mean, mm. this bridge looks beautiful in that mm. footage, but very kind of quite fragile, and yeah. you think, what's under the water yes. here? You know, these columns. How can this have been toppled mm. by a, a, a boat going... by a you know, large ship yeah. going into it? It's really, It's the really kind of thing that, that the mere mortals who have got nothing, no idea about marine engineering... I mean, we just don't know. It's a bit like planes. You yeah. just don't you want to know about the go, engines no. and the, you know, how, when was the last exactly. time they were checked and exactly. has the pilot taken a breathalyzer right. test? I mean, one stuff. of the things they're saying about this particular bridge is that the concrete sort of stanchions that would normally be quite high up above yeah. the water level yeah. on this on this particular bridge would not and so normally speaking if it was if a boat did hit mm. the, the stanchion of the bridge it would sort of hit a concrete base yeah this one apparently didn't so it effectively just knocked it out which is extraordinary and the other thing they're saying is that because the, the, the ships are so big now mm. uh, you heard john say they're 400 meters long um, they're getting bigger and the bridges bigger. are still built from and decades bridges, ago and the bridges this bridge That's was built in problem. 1977 yeah. if you look at that picture there yeah. the, the the boat uh, this is I'm sorry. This is live drone uh, helicopter footage. Um, the the, sh the ship actually looks bigger than the bridge. It does. You wonder how that's even going to try and. Get that's another thing it. about cruise ships that really bothers yeah. me. I mean, I remember being in Naples once, and this cruise ship came in, and it was so big. It's so huge. It just didn't look like it was seaworthy. Mm. It looked like if you're in, in in a storm in that thing, it's just going to tip over because yeah. it goes. It's about sort of 15 stories high, yeah. 20 stories high, and you think that can't be right. Yeah, and they've been talking about the impact this is going to have on the on the on the port here, yeah. and on the you know the massive impact it's going to have on the economy, right. as well as the huge disruption to people. Yeah. It's going to take a while to rebuild this. Yeah. I know Biden has been. And there was a great. I was going to say um, speaking, but actually dr dr sort of slurring his yeah. words. He's been talking about how it's going to be rebuilt and right. going to pay for all of it and other. He seems to be a bit obsessed. He with did also manage to. Uh, he did also manage to say that he'd been over that bridge many times on the train. Uh, unfortunately, oh. it's a road bridge. Yeah, that, so, where does that come from? Well, I think he, he was doesn't talking seem about... like a well man. From what he was saying tonight, he really doesn't no. seem to have improved. Actually, no, I don't think he has. Um, but we'll talk some more about this. I'm sure later on, Emma's here for the show with the panel. Of course, we'll be looking at all the stories coming out uh, later on in the papers. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham. After the break tonight, big interview with Phil Browder discussing the Moscow terror attack and the imprisonment of American journalist Evan Gershkovich. See you there. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Russia's security service chief, Alexander Brotnikov, has suggested that Britain, the US and Ukraine could have been behind the attack on a concert hall in Moscow that killed more than 130 people on Friday. Islamic State claimed responsibility for the shooting and US intelligence indicates ISIS-K, an Afghan branch of the Islamic State, was indeed behind the attack. This comes as Russia extends the arrest of Wall Street journalist Evan Gershkovich to June, just days before the one-year anniversary of him being held behind bars on these bogus charges of espionage. Charges, of course, that he and the Wall Street Journal deny. I'm joined now by financier uh, whose firm was once the largest foreign investor in Russia, but who now campaigns against corruption in the Kremlin. Uh, it is, of course, Bill Browder. Bill, very good uh, afternoon, to, uh, good evening to you, I should say. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, it's been a lot of speculation about ISIS-K and a lot of interest in how uh, they got into Russia, why they decided to attack uh, in the way that they did, what the connection is with Turkey, what the connection is uh, with the various sort of stands around the places where they, where they are. What's your take on exactly who was responsible for that, and exactly why they did what they did. Well, so there's, there's basically uh, three, three credit, there's three th theories about why this terrorist attack took place. Two of them are credible, one of them is not. Right. Uh, the most obvious theory is what's on the surface, which is that you have ISIS, um, a bunch of Islamic terrorists, um, who committed this act of terrorism, announced that they were responsible for it, have made further threats to Russia, and even videoed uh, the terrorist incident. And of course, uh, it's all supported by the fact that you have a number of, of um, individuals, alleged individuals who are Islamic uh, people from the uh, Republic of, or the country of Tajikistan. Yes. So that's theory number one. Uh, theory number two is that um, Putin did this to himself. And that may sound very horrible and cynical, but uh, he's done this before. Uh, back when he was prime minister, before he was president, um, Putin was responsible for having the Russian security services plant a number of apartment bombs throughout Moscow and other parts of Russia, blow up a lot of citizens, create panic and disarray. He blamed it on the Chechens at the time and then launched a brutal second war against the Chechens in which more than 50,000 civilians died. And that, that war, um, that this manufactured war where he blamed the Chechens was what got him into the presidency. And so it's entirely plausible and within reason that that uh, Putin may have been responsible. And the, and the fact that there that the um, regime is coming up with all these crazy theories, theory number three, that somehow it's the U.S., Britain and Ukraine that did it, um, would suggest 
strongly that theory number two is the is the most likely scenario. Yes, I think so. And does that mean, therefore, that if he was to retaliate in some way, shape or form, um, he would now have his pick of deciding where to retaliate? So, I mean, according to, to his kind of uh, version of events, if it was Ukraine, he could retaliate there, uh, which we don't, don't believe that it is. If it was Britain, uh, which we don't believe that it is, he could retaliate there. How does he retaliate against the Americans? Well, I mean, the reality is he can retaliate against anybody he wants to retaliate against. He doesn't need a terrorist incident to do that. Um, I think that, that you know, that this thing happened either because they wanted to create a terrorist incident or it happened just because they were victims of terrorism. But either way, um, he's going to try to use it um, for his own, own personal reasons, for his own propaganda. Mm. I don't think these statements are meant for us. These statements are meant for the domestic audience in Russia. He needs to... Um, convince them that for whatever it's worth, that he's not, it's not, he's not at fault. He's either not at fault for doing it or he's not at fault um, for preventing it. Yes. Um, but that's a hard thing to do because he was warned by the Americans explicitly that there was a terrorist incident that was going to happen. Mm. It was going to happen at a concert place. The Americans were telling all Americans, stay away from concerts. Mm. And, um, and then as far as we could see on videos, these guys just walked right into this place. There was no security. Right. Um, and in fact, I've seen videos in the last few hours where policemen are walking around with police dogs while the terrorists are running around the the uh, concert center and doing nothing. Right. Well, I was told there was a police station actually inside the venue as well. Uh, whether or not they would open or whether they were doing anything is anybody's guess. But if it was a genuine terrorist attack, I'm also told that the, the resentment that these particular ISIS-K groups feel against Russia goes back to Syria, goes back to um, Putin's backing of Bashar Assad um, and the way he treated ISIS. Well, there's, there's no question that, that Putin is a very unpopular person in the Middle East for mm. what he's done in Syria. He's also a very unpopular person among Muslims for what he did in Chechnya. Right. In Chechnya, um, he, he massacred huge, huge numbers of civilians. And, and they, they didn't forget that. And um, their Muslim brothers didn't forget that. And so, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't think anything justifies killing uh, civilians. But, but there's a lot of angry people out there. And it's a big, you know, pot of anger just uh, brewing, and, and he's done nothing to um, to protect these people. You know, if 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 you had if you and I had been standing in Moscow with a sign that said Putin is a criminal, um, we'd been we'd be arrested within a minute. Right. Just the two of us. Yes. But um, it took them an hour and a half to uh, uh, to bring a, a a team of people into the into the theater when it was on fire, and long after these um, perpetrators had left, and so. It, it, it says there's either gross incompetence um, among the security services or they were involved and they just had to uh, wait a while to make sure it was all sort of going to plan. Yeah. Do you suspect there may be more of these types of attacks for whatever reason? Well, um, if we look back to 24 years ago when Putin first came to power, um, first there was one apartment building that, that was blown up by, by his security services, then another one and then another one, and it created a sense of mass panic of true feeling of horror and terror. Mm. I was in Moscow at the time. I remember going to sleep at night and wondering whether my apartment building was going to blow up. And by the time he was done, the entire Russian population was on his side wanting to exact revenge. And if, well, let's just say that there's another one of these incidents mm. and, um, and they can successfully blame it on some outside force, maybe on Ukraine or whatever. Um, that would be a good way to um, uh, energize the Russian people, get them up for a mass conscription, uh, there, uh, the other thing that's important to know is that uh, Russia is running out of troops. They need more troops. They need more warm bodies to be killed in battle. And the best way to do that is to draft up a half a million other young men, which would be unpopular. But maybe it wouldn't be so unpopular if uh, if there was, uh, you know, people frothing at the mouth about some foreign enemies that are bringing terror to, to the Russian streets. No, of course. I was going to ask you about what you see happening for the rest of this year in Ukraine in terms of the way that, that uh, the, the, the war is conducted, if you like, by, by Putin, because obviously there's going to be a US presidential election. Donald Trump has said that, you know, he would bring a stop to the war immediately as soon as he got elected, if he was elected. Biden um, doesn't seem to be too sure precisely where he stands on on putting money in. Britain still seems to be very much about backing Zelensky with, with money and weapons. I mean, what's going to happen, do you think? Well, um, so Biden is very clearly wanting to give Ukrainian, Ukrainians more money and weapons. Uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives um, 
has blocked a vote on it um, because he's taking instructions from Trump, who inexplicably wants to sabotage the Ukrainians. Um, and so if if so, I, I would predict that the sixty three billion dollars that's been blocked will become unblocked in the near future. That will allow the Ukrainians to buy the weapons they need. Uh, I don't think the Russians will make that much more progress in the near term along as long as the Ukrainians get that money and get those weapons. And then the big wild card is November uh, November this year when when the election happens. Mm. If Trump does get elected, um, he said he's going to cut off Ukraine. Mm. Why? We don't know. Um, but if he does, then we have a much bigger problem here in Europe because that means we've got to basically double the amount of financial aid and military aid to Ukraine because the Americans will be sitting it out. And do we have that money? Do we have the will? I don't know. And if we don't, then the Russians will win in Ukraine. Yeah. And if they do win in Ukraine, then then their next top, next stop is the Baltics. And those countries happen to be NATO allies, and we have a duty, uh, a, a treaty obligation to protect them. Yes. And so, well, I it's mean, it's a really, it's slightly, it's slightly. I mean, from Trump's perspective, it's slightly different to that, isn't it? I mean, he would say, actually, no, he wants to stop the war, and what he doesn't want to do is continue to bankroll it. So, I mean, I take your point absolutely, but his argument is that you know the American people don't want to continue to give money, and there's a lot of people in this country as well who don't think we should be giving billions and billions and billions of pounds to a country to continue a war uh, when we haven't got very much money for our own troops. Well, we can either spend billions and billions or hundreds of billions when we're at war with Russia. It so all depends on... Yeah, know, well, that all depends if you believe... Now, yeah, but that, yeah, but hang on, Bill. That all depends if you'd actually believe that Russia would wage war on NATO. I, I'm, I'm no well, expert, when, but, I, but I know there are a lot of experts who don't believe they would do that. There's a lot of, you know, sabre-rattling going on, isn't there? Well, I mean, all you have to do is listen to the speeches coming out of the Kremlin, and and they're they're saying Ukraine is just the first stop. I mean, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I think, but as you say, you know, you, you know you, better you, you than want... yeah, but, but as you know better than anyone, Bill, so much of that is for domestic consumption as well, isn't it? Well, um, uh, you know, they've they pretty much said what they were going to do all the way from the start. They said they were going to, they, they, you know, uh, you know, do, do you want to gamble with our future a hundred times worse, or or do you want to um, buy some cheap insurance right now? And I would argue that. Uh, uh, whatever the yes. cost is right now, it's all hell of a lot war, less than it would but be at, in, at the in, moment. In the with all of the aid that we have given to Ukraine, the war does not seem to be doing anything other than being in a sort of stalemate, where where you know the wheels continue to turn in the in the mud, if you like. But nobody's really gaining any ground. Nobody's really winning. You know, it's a kind of a, 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 a zero sum game, isn't it? Yeah. Well, but you know, but you you can like you know tr sort of fantasize and say, God, I wish there was peace. Putin doesn't want peace. Putin wants to take over Ukraine. That's the problem. You know, we didn't ask for this war. Yeah. He's the one doing this war. It's not, right. it's not you know, well, I, mean, I mean, just, you might, just you might make wishing, that argument. For, wishing for wish things you, to wish happen you, doesn't make them happen. I wish you'd make that argument to the UN because maybe they would call for a ceasefire, which is what they've just done in Gaza, despite the fact that Hamas wants to destroy Israel um, and they're backing well, uh, a ceasefire without the hostages being given up, but they don't seem too interested in having a ceasefire in Ukraine. Well, uh, the, the, um, even if the UN was to call for a ceasefire in Russia, Putin's not going to do a ceasefire. And so, what do you want to do? I mean, do you want to do you want to just let Putin win, or or and and, and then put ourselves in well, the wrong way? That's or, not or... what I'm suggesting. I'm just saying that the, the point of view that you put forward there as being, you know, Trump is wrong, and everybody else who wants, you know, to fight Putin is right. You know, there are two sides to every coin, and I'm just pointing out that there are some people who agree with Donald Trump that it'd be better to try and stop the war. Well, and basically, Donald Trump's the only person in the Republican Party who who has this position. All the other Republicans in Washington understand. That what's at stake here? That that basically world peace is at stake here if we don't yeah. stop Russia. But he's also the Ukraine. only Republican that will that will probably get into the White House. So I mean, you have to take him seriously as, as, as much as you may not want well, to. And, and I do take him seriously, and I think we're in deep trouble um, as far as Ukraine is concerned if he becomes the president of the United States. Well, we shall see. Um, finally, let me just ask you about this terrible situation uh, with our colleague uh, Evan Gershkovich, who has now learned once again uh, that he will be. Uh, Withheld, will be withheld and, and, and denied freedom uh, until June. I mean, how much longer can they get away with this? I heard you on um, James Max's show saying, you know, this is a, a rogue state, they do what they like, they don't pay attention to the rule of law. I get all that. Um, is there anything that we can do to get Evan out? Well, I think that, that by talking about him continuously, by calling for his release, um, it keeps the government of the United States um, on, on one point here. I mean, the one thing you need to understand is that he's a he. That Putin took him hostage because he worked for the Wall Street Journal. He would obviously be considered to be a high value person for the United States. Mm. Um, the moment that he was arrested, 
um, uh, President Biden said this this shouldn't have happened, and they and they designated him as unlawfully detained under the Levinson Act, and so he's he's the highest priority hot U.S. hostage right now, and the Americans want him out very badly. Um, Putin has has somebody he wants out of Berlin, out of a German prison, very badly. I suspect a deal will get done at some point in the future. These things take longer than than they should. Um, but in the meantime, it's a very, very unpleasant situation for a young man who did absolutely nothing wrong, who was just plucked out of the street because he happened to be an American working for the wrong uh, organization as yeah. far as Putin was concerned. Yeah, it is a shocking state of affairs and terrible for his family. But, Bill, listen, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for talking to us. Bill Browder, uh, they're reporting in to us on the latest situation in Moscow uh, where you could always have one or two or maybe even three truths, if you like. Uh, Putin's truth, the truth... Uh, the truth coming out of the United Nations, the truth, you know, even more than three if you want, the truth coming out of the Trump um, soon-to-be administration, we shall see. Uh, we'll keep you uh, fully abreast of all of it, though, and we wish our colleague Evan very, very well, of course, indeed, and his family. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. Up next, one of the most ludicrous questions ever asked. Here it is. Is the countryside racist? Well, BBC Countryfile seems to think so. Of course they do. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oh, Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Now, just imagine this. There is disturbing evidence of racism in the countryside, according to, you guessed it, 
the BBC. Country File presenter John Craven claims while many white people insist there is no racial prejudice in rural Britain, academics say it can actually manifest in mundane ways like staring, silence, laughter or mutterings. It follows a controversial report in February by the Wildlife and Countryside Link, a group with 80 members which labelled the countryside a racist colonial white space. I mean... Really? Joining me now to discuss this is Rakeem Bissat, social commentator, good friend of the show. Rakeem, very good uh, uh, evening to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Well, I mean, it comes as no surprise that the BBC uh, would keep continually sort of pushing this particular agenda. I mean, the countryside, um, as far as the BBC is concerned, is only somewhere you go when Glastonbury's on. I mean, most of them hang around, you know, the closest thing they've seen to the countryside uh, is Hyde Park, you know. Um, when you go to the countryside, it's a bit different. I know what, what it's like in the countryside, and you can walk into a country pub, no matter who you are, no matter what colour your skin is, and get people muttering and looking and going silent because they're not used to seeing people that they don't see every day. No, absolutely. And I think that these anti-countryside narratives, oh, we're talking about people now staring and laughing. Yeah. Oh, I think that it's quite remarkable. This is... Uh, Pseudo-intellectual nonsense, uh, in my view. Yeah. If we weren't to have a serious debate about racism in Britain, I'd focus less on the rural parts of the country because I think some of the biggest problems, if we want to talk about issues surrounding social cohesion, then th th that's an issue which is a serious issue in more urban parts of the country. Right. Uh, well, this is it, in, in, in more racially mixed parts of the country, actually. Indeed. Because, I mean, I was uh, reading, I mentioned this the other day, I was reading Matthew Said's piece in the Sunday Times, mm. not this one Sunday, but the Sunday before. He went to Rochdale, um, where she described as a place that was kind of unrecognisable, really, as part of Britain. You know, it had, uh, as he came off the station, within uh, his, 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 his kind of um, ability to look around, six mosques. There was a school opposite this railway station that had 450 children in it, only one of whom was white. And then sort of further down the road, they had a sort of white area where all the white people lived and where there was a school with about 400 white kids in it with hardly any uh, ethnic minority kids. And so if that's the state of affairs in Rochdale, it's no wonder there are racial tensions because it's not mixed at all. No, absolutely. And I think there's very serious issues surrounding um, very intense forms of social segregation along ethnic and religious lines across a, a string of post-industrial towns across northern England. And I think that those would be the kind of issues that I'd be really focusing on if people are very serious about community relations. I'd make this point as well, Mike, that I'm, I live in Luton, uh, in Bedfordshire. Some of the most successful ethnic minority businesses are not in Luton and Bedford in the county. In fact, they're in more rural areas. So I think that if there was such a strong degree of racial hostility in the countryside, would we see ethnic minority-owned businesses, ethnic minority entrepreneurs doing well in more rural parts of the county? I'm not so sure. No, exactly right. I mean, I saw David Lammy was talking about this the other day. He said that he goes to visit his in-laws in Sussex and feels like he's the only black guy there. Well, guess what? That's a bit what Sussex is like, because, you know, once you get outside of, as you say, the metropolitan areas of Great Britain, mm. Birmingham, Manchester, you know, Liverpool, London, you know, Bristol, Leeds, Glasgow, you don't see Indeed. very many people who are not white, you know. Large swathes of Britain are actually full of white people. It's still an 86% white country. And I think the thing is, if you live in London or Manchester, you might not think that. But, I mean, David Lammy should know better, really, shouldn't he? Well, I, I, I'd make the point that if you look at the a demographic change in rural areas. Over the course of the 21st century, the ethnic minority population in rural England has actually increased. So if there was such a, such a high level of racial hostility, I don't think you'd see more ethnic minority families moving from more urban parts of the country to more rural communities in England. So I think that the stats show that, in fact, more and more ethnic minorities are actually willing to move to rural areas. And I'd also make this point that people talk about, you know, people having difficulties in terms of accessing the countryside. Of course, we could talk about improving public transportation links between more urban parts of the country, linking them better with rural parts of the country. But the reality is, Mike, that more eth certain ethnic minority communities, it, it, the people in those communities, they may prefer, or rather they would prioritise their time, energy and resources towards visiting their countries of origin. You yeah. have certain ethnic minority people. They're more well-travelled in a global sense as opposed to being well-travelled in their own country. And ultimately, this just comes down to personal preferences.
Well, exactly right. And, I mean, the other thing is, is that we should stop taking any of these groups, like this countryside link group, with 80 members. You know, mm. I mean, so what? I mean, I've seen more people on a coach, you know, 80 members who think it's a white colonial space. Well, I don't give a, a damn what they think, to be honest, because they don't represent anybody. No, absolutely. I think many of these groups, in my view, that they're, they're wholly unrepresentative. Um, I, I think they have a divisive agenda. I think that many of these groups and organisations, they know full well that the, the English countryside is a, is, a, is a great source of national belonging for many people in the country, whether they live in the rural areas or they don't live in the rural areas. It's a very strong part of British heritage, our traditions, and, and I think that, in a sense, that what you're seeing here, and I think you have institutions such as the BBC, I think that as opposed to celebrating our country's heritage and traditions, because they feel that the very people who care about this are the kind of people who don't hold their own social and political values, this is precisely why I think you see this anti-countryside rhetoric very much coming into play in mainstream discourse. It brings you back to the whole Brexit debate, doesn't it? They don't like the fact that, you know, there might be people in the north of England... Um, who would be calling themselves probably working-class Tories who didn't want the idea mm. of open borders, who wanted to vote for Brexit. They don't really like that idea of those people being British in the same way they don't like people living in the shires, um, shooting grouse and, you know, catching rabbits mm. and cooking them in a pot and thinking that they must be horrible racists because they're all, you know, old military types. It's ludicrous. And, I mean, if I were BBC, I would concentrate more on turning Country File back into a show actually about the country because I'm told they spend most of their time now talking about diversity and inclusion um, and biodiversity and, you know, rewilding farms and making sure that farmers can't actually grow anything, um, which brings them to demonstrate in London, as they did last night, um, because they're surrounded by idiots from Country Farm. No, absolutely. And I think wouldn't it be nice to have a show that actually celebrate the countryside, yeah. which has inspired some of the most finest books and music that's ever been produced in England? Yeah. I think that what we need to what we need there needs to be a reconnection with our heritage and traditions, as opposed to trashing them. And I'd expect a bit better from the national public broadcaster, but I think in recent times it's really <laughs> it's it, it, it suffered quite a decline, really, uh, in that sense. But I don't think that the way the BBC treats these issues, especially when it comes to the people's national pride in the countryside, the, the, their operations, their activities, and indeed their programmes, I don't think they're necessarily representative of mainstream opinion. No, I think that's absolutely right. But I think we know, Rakeem, given what's happened mm. to the BBC, even just in the time that you and I have known each other, I mean, I can't believe the collapse of the organisation. It's literally gone from bad to worse, week to week. It's now, this is probably the mm. worst last 12 months it's ever had. No, absolutely. And I think that w when we look at recent social developments, including the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, I think what we've seen, we've seen that import, um, importation of American racial identity politics. And I think that it's contaminated public sector institutions, including the BBC, but also the NHS and many of our state schools. And I think that it's a real shame because if you want to, if you want to champion a civic nationalism, a patriotism that can bring together a diversity of groups. That includes taking pride in your own country's heritage and traditions, and that should have the English countryside at the heart of it, actually. Yeah, absolutely right. Couldn't agree more. Rakeem, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Rakeem Hassan, uh, they're making very sensible points about these complete and utter bozos who go on and on about how this is racist, that's racist, the countryside's racist, you know, cheese is racist, cows are racist, you know, buses are racist. It's ridiculous. Totally and utter madness. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up on the other side, we're going to look at more screw-ups by the British border force, and also, just how smart are those smart meters? Do not go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. 
and yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now it's time for taking the mic. Now, I don't remember the last time anyone had anything good to say about the Border Force. More often than not, we refer to them here in the Independent Republic as the Border Farce, largely because they don't work very well at all. There are around 10,000 people working for them, mostly at airports and seaports around the United Kingdom. They are answerable to the Home Office, even though we also know that that hasn't worked properly for over a decade. We already know that they are sympathetic to the plight of illegal migrants, and we already know that an investigation into their practices suggests that their defence of these islands is more porous than a sieve in the water. We also know that they're not very good at stopping undesirables from coming here. Quite often, it is Border Force vessels that rescue migrants from the English Channel who don't actually need rescuing ferrying them to our shores without even being asked to do so. Once they're here, neither are Border Force particularly good at getting rid of them. Deportations are at an all-time low. And to make matters worse, we also know that their union has now lodged a legal case against the government because of its policy to send failed asylum seekers to Rwanda. In other words, they're a bunch of lefties who hate the Tories and love refugees. Brilliant. Today, we find out that things go much further than that. A shocking piece of footage has emerged of two Israeli brothers who travelled to this country to publicise the Hamas atrocities of October the 7th and who were detained for two hours by aggressive and possibly anti-Semitic staff at Manchester Airport. What you're about to see beggars belief. We need to conduct something. Okay. Nobody's saying country. that. Nobody has said that once. So knock the attitude off. Okay. We've made the decision and you're coming in. So just let us do the checks we need to do and keep quiet. Look at me. OK, you clear with that? Good. We're the bosses, not you, all right? That was how border guards spoke to Daniel and Naria Sharabi, who are described as heroes of the carnage at the music festival on the 7th of October. They defended more than 30 people from Hamas terrorists as they sheltered behind a tank. They fired unfamiliar weapons using only instructions over the phone from an Israeli reserve commander. They saved countless lives as dozens were being murdered around them. But when they landed in this country, supposedly, supposedly the cradle of democracy, they were treated abominably. I have no doubt that we were detained because we were Israeli, said Daniel. We kept asking the officials why they had stopped us. Was it because we were Israeli or because we were Jewish? His brother, Nereya, said, they asked us what we came to do here. And as soon as I said we survived the October the 7th massacre and I'm here to share my memories, the guys just flipped. And from that moment, he just started to interrogate us. 
Home Secretary James Cleverly has quite rightly ordered an investigation into what happened. Amongst the allegations is that the aggressive officers also said they, in quotes, had to make sure you're not going to do, uh, not going to do what you are doing in Gaza over here. Truly sickling, truly awful, and so very un-British. What a very sorry state of affairs. And what a pity they can't be this robust with the undocumented young men coming here in their thousands every single week. Now, our next story is a waste of energy, literally. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the, the guest that we've got on it is, because it turns out that smart meters are actually pretty dim. Nearly four million of them aren't working properly because they weren't in smart mode when they should have been, leaving people paying for gas and electricity that they didn't use. Let's talk to consumer expert Adrian Mills. Adrian, very good to see you. Nice to see you, Mike. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, smart meters not being very smart comes as no surprise to me, but I didn't realise quite so many of them, nearly 4 million. Well, the, the, you've got to bear in mind there's over 30 million installed in homes right. across the United Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, the government and the people that regulate this say, well, actually, there's only a small percentage, but it's 10%. That's a big percentage. It is a big it? percentage. Uh, and the question, do you have a smart meter? I do not have a smart meter. And I don't either. And I refuse to have one as well. well. Do you know something? The amount of people that say to me, oh, I've actually had a letter from my supplier and I've got to have a smart yeah. meter fitted, or I've had a phone call call, I've had a letter. You do not, under any circumstances, right. have to comply with those letters. You are under no obligation, mm. legally or whatever, right. to have a smart meter fitted in your home. Yes. Now, the question after that is, who then reads your meter? Mm. I read my own meter at yes. home and I send the information Most online. Most people do that, yeah. yeah. I refuse to do that as now, well. Now, why do you refuse On to do that? On the grounds that I'm not employed by the energy company, right? I've got Scottish Power. They, they supply my, my electricity. I don't have gas. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's their job to read the meter. They should send somebody out and get them to read the meter. Well, I think they send somebody out once in a blue moon. Yeah. And the problem with those smart meters, by the way, mm. is that they say that actually the information is still being read and stored... Right. But, of course, you will be getting a bogus bill. You'll either be getting one that's far too low, mm. that in, say, six months a year when the uh, problem is solved, right. you'll get this humongous bill and go, hang on a minute. And go, oh, well, we're sorry, your meter wasn't actually registering at yeah. the time. So it, sh it throws your this is the finances problem. out of kilter. The other thing, that my other pet peeve about these energy businesses is that they're always trying to demand that you give them a direct debit. And we've seen loads of stories, I did a couple last week, of people who have had thousands of pounds taken out of their account because of some error... And then you never get it back for, like, weeks on end. I have said, and I'll say it again now, because we're going into the spring this summer where we're using, ho hopefully, less energy. Yeah. Look, go online, look at the statements and look at how much money mm. you have on account with your supplier. Yeah. I know one of the exec producers here actually said to me when I mentioned on another show, they went, oh, my God, I discovered I had nearly 700 right. quid on account. Don't give it to them. No, you can ask for it back. It's not easy yeah. to get it back, but it's your money. Right. It's not there. But, you see, I prefer to go around the other way, where I go, I'll tell you what I'll do. You send me a bill, I'll pay the bill. I'm not going to give you money for a bill that you think I might get six months down in the, the road. Future. And then you can hold all that money for yeah. me just in case I can't yeah. afford it. You know, I'll tell you whether I can afford it and I'll tell you when I'm going to pay you. And, of course, then they say, oh, well, we give you a better rate if you just go on a direct well, debit. Well, that, that is... No, the, don't want it. That is the problem, is that if you have a smart meter, um, then you will probably be offered something a few percent cheaper in right. terms of unit price than somebody who hasn't. But, actually, it's infinitesimal. Mm. The problem, I think, and this is what the direction we're going in, is dynamic pricing. Yes. Um, and what they're su suggesting here is that we're going to charge you a lot more when you use your meter in, say, the peak hours. Right. So any time from about 9 o'clock in the morning right through to about 5 o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. But then I go, well, hang on a minute. I look at my 93-year-old mom and she likes to have a little bit of heating on and yeah. she does a, uses a washing machine, right. goes to bed early. So does that mean she's going to be paying a lot more than me? Yeah. What about people at hospitals and places? There's, right. It's too well, this dark is an area. And I mean, I know it's a big area this is what we're talking about, but I know plenty of people in business, particularly people that run hospitality, restaurants, pubs, that kind of thing. I mean, they've been absolutely crippled by the increase in um, uh, in energy prices because, you know, they've gone from paying... I know a guy who's gone from paying something like 150000 a year to 400000 yeah. a year for his electricity. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can it's, believe that. It's, it's not it's, sustainable. Well, and, and especially you talk about hospitality. My wife's a restaurateur, yeah. uh, you know, and that's exactly what happened to us, is that everything, every single thing that you can imagine in the hospitality industry, of course, then you'll get customers saying, well, the prices have gone up, yeah. it's expensive, but well, we've yeah. got to cover that cost Absolutely. somewhere. Yeah, exactly right. So what do you do? If, I mean, how do you know if your smart meter isn't working properly? And if it's not, 
How do you fix that? Well, you contact your supplier if you've got if you suggest if there's any inkling that there's a problem. Right. And the only way you'll get an inkling there's a problem is if perhaps your bills are much lower than they were last year. Right. But it could theoretically be a problem that goes back a whole year. Yeah. So you're never quite sure. Um, I would suggest, and I know you don't want to do it, is just keep reading your yeah. meter and thinking, that seems a fairly Yeah, reasonable. I was just a bit curmudgeonly about that. I mean, I wouldn't advise everybody else to do that. I just don't particularly want to do it. But, yeah, I mean, obviously that does make sense. If you can find it, if you can locate it, and if you can read it, because not everybody can. No, no. And, 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 the, and I would suggest that if you are forced to actually have a meter, so some people ch change supplier and yeah. they go, well, we'll only offer you this rate if you have a smart meter. Right. You think, well, actually, I'll go with it. No, talk to your citizens' advice bureau mm. and they will say to you, do not fall for this. It right. is absolutely not in their remit to push you to have something that you don't want. Because was there not a time as well when some of these companies would actually break into your house and put the meter in? Uh, well, if there, there's... Uh, They've stopped doing that There's now, quite a few cases of people that perhaps were on their benefits yeah. where perhaps were finding it difficult to pay and yeah. uh, there was quite a lot of footage on the news of people sort of no knocking down the door right. um, and just fitting something and then people coming back and going, who the hell's yeah, been in the house? exactly. Outrageous, totally outrageous. But they're not allowed to do that, really, are no, they? No, they're not. No, they're not. Although, what, a, a number of the companies actually withdrew from doing that mm. But quite casually, they've slowly eased back into that market yeah. because they feel that actually there is a lot of debt that needs to be recovered. Right. Rightly so, but there's ways and means of going about it. Yes, but of course, most people that I talk to who are quite happy to pay for what they've used and quite happy to be treated fairly, they always say the problem with all of this business, this gas, electricity, energy business, is that it's the consumer that gets stuked every every single time you oh. turn around. You know, oh, electricity prices have gone up because of Ukraine. Oh, just pay more. You know, oh, there's been a bit of a shortfall because some companies have gone bust. You pay more. Yeah. You know, oh, we've got to have some green renewables. You pay some more for that. Yeah. You know, we're always getting uh, the bill. Well, you've got to remember as well, the green renewables are, are, are purely dependent on sunshine and yeah. wind. And if the well, weather's and us, not... Well, uh, yeah, we keep subsidising Absolutely. It. If the weather's not giving you what you want, then... And uh, uh, my fear is, I mean, who is going to be getting up at, say, 11 o'clock at night or before they go to bed and putting on their washing yeah, machine, yeah. you know, if you've got a few kids that you're... It's just, I, it's just another way of screwing money out of the consumer, mm. and I guarantee... I mean, what they say is that they want 75% of all households to have smart meters yeah. by the, the year 2025. It is not going to happen. Yeah. It's impossible. And then the government, well, of course, it won't be this government, will it? It'll probably be another no. government I and mean, it'll just roll on another few exactly, years. Exactly. So, anyway, the, the, the situation is this. If you think you're getting ripped off, you know, get in touch with the company, get in touch with consumers and get in touch with people like yourself. Absolutely. And can I just say, 30 years on, I never thought I'd be able to sit in and say, and so we rang the gas board. <laughs> but, hey... <laughs> There you go. Brilliant. Great stuff. Adrian Mills, thank you very much indeed. You're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. At the start of the next hour, we're going to look at the chilling of sympathy towards Israel over their conduct in Gaza, as even Donald Trump seems to have had enough. Really? All that and some more coming up. Stay where you are. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk. We're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, the RAF conducts an airlift of food supplies for the first time, days after Israel blocked UN aid deliveries to northern Gaza. Brits have rushed to find out more about their own chances of getting cancer following the Princess of Wales' diagnosis announcement. And taxi drivers warn they will be wiped out in the new forest under new council plans to ban cabbies whose petrol or diesel cars are more than five years old. Now, there's plenty of things that you might imagine would be banned in dictatorships around the world to prevent the influence of the running dogs of Western imperialism. You might imagine champagne would be off the menu. You would consider Cadillacs and Bentleys might join them, and there would be certainly no room or any place for the decadence of Hollywood. Well, in North Korea, they've come up with something even more surprising, something most of us would not think could destabilise a people's republic and have them all longing to escape to Western lifestyles. That thing is, believe it or not, the humble blue jean. That's right, the censors and party bigwigs in North Korea have declared genes to be the indicators and enablers of a capitalist, degraded society. And they're not having any of it. How do we know? We told you last week they've launched their own version of Netflix in Pyongyang, but there's no Harry and Meghan or a host of Tinseltown epics either. Mostly, the channel is dedicated to the daily worship of Kim Jong-un, the great leader. But wait, there's something else to watch, and it's rather a shock. It's Alan Titchmarsh with his gardening show. Controversially, though, you're not allowed to see all of it. Censors have blurred out the jeans he's wearing, as you can see, while gardening, for fear it might start a revolution. There is, they say, a risk of an invasion of a capitalistic lifestyle. Mullets and piercings have been banned, on, uh, banned there for 20, quite a few years, and now jeans have joined them. Korean Television uh, Central broadcast a segment of Alan kneeling in a garden in Hatfield House, Hertfordshire, while demonstrating 17th century gardening techniques. But without the trousers, he just looks like a floating torso. No sign of the symbol of American imperialism or their dogs of war. Apparently, the North Koreans are quite keen on Titch, though. Even they cut his hour-long programme down to 15 minutes and replaced his commentary with the Korean narrator and some local traditional instrumental music. I'd love to hear it. When they first started showing his show in 2022, he said, I'm surprised and very pleased that the show has transcended barriers. I have no idea whether I have any Korean following North or South, I just think it's rather nice that whichever country in the world it is, gardening can bring people together. Beware, though, because apparently there are serious legal sanctions against smuggling in TV shows and films that are not approved by the state. Anyone watching could be sentenced to death. Don't tell the BBC. You wouldn't want to give them any ideas. 
Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages, but before anyone else, let's take a look at the Metro newspaper, which, uh, for fairly obvious reasons, has gone with Heartbreak Bridge, a big picture uh, of that collapsed bridge in Baltimore. Absolutely incredible story. Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed in seconds, as we've been talking about. And Maryland's Governor Wes Moore says it is absolutely heartbreaking. For 47 years, it is all we have known. Nobody really still knows what could have possibly caused a bridge that size to just be hit by one ship and suddenly dissolve just before our very eyes into the water below. Extraordinary. We'll be looking um, at that more later on in the show when the panel return and we'll have some other stories from the other papers as well. But let's go now to the situation in the Middle East because the RAF has airlifted food supplies to Palestinian civilians for the first time and that's days after Israel blocked UN aid deliveries to northern Gaza. And it comes after Donald Trump, the former US president and Republican candidate, of course, in November's election in the US, has warned Israel that it is losing international support and should finish up its war in Gaza. Joining us now, we've got Talk TV's war correspondent, Tom Much. Tom, very good evening to you. Thanks very much indeed once again for joining us. Um, I suppose I should really ask you about uh, what happened at the UN yesterday because obviously uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was not happy about the fact that uh, the US did not veto um, the vote for a ceasefire at the Security Council. Has that made any difference really on the ground at this point? It actually has. Now, it'll be a long time before the Security Council resolution will actually make a difference on the battlefield itself, whether it might make Israel's guns go quiet in Gaza. But what it has done is it has severely dented, even more than it already was, Benjamin Netanyahu's reputation within Israel itself. Right. Because at least up until now, despite the intelligence and military failures that led to October the 7th, he could still claim to have the, more or less the backing of Joe Biden and the United States. Now he doesn't even have that to fall back on. And the way that he reacted by cancelling this delegation that was due to discuss a possible Israeli offensive in Rafa from going to the United States has made him sort of look like a petulant child. So even a lot of people who were backing Netanyahu out of wartime solidarity, including many of the major newspapers in Israel, are now fairly fed up with him and many are calling for him to go. Right. Tom, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Tom Much there reporting into us from uh, the Middle East because the problem for, I suppose, Netanyahu now uh, is if he's lost the support of Britain, which he appears to have done at the UN, uh, and possibly now America and possibly even Donald Trump, where do they go from there? We'll talk to Emma Wolf about that in a second. But now, the rot runs deep here. In our own institutions, though, an investigation has been launched into the purported anti-Semitic border force staffers who detained... October the 7th survivors for two hours while they were apparently told you're not going to do what you're doing in Gaza over here. Have another look at what they did. We need to conduct, OK? Do do Nobody's saying that. Country. Nobody has said that once. So knock the attitude off. Okay. We've made the decision and you're coming in. So just let us okay. do the checks we need to do and keep quiet. Okay. Look at me. OK, okay. you're clear with that? Okay. Good. We're the bosses, not you, all right? I mean... I've seen some pretty poor behaviour by some um, border force people and police and all the rest of it, but I don't think I've seen anything quite as bad as that. Emma Wolf's back again. Emma, extraordinary uh, piece of footage, that, isn't it? Because really shameful. you can't believe, one, that they would talk to anybody like that, mm. but when you find out who it is they're talking to like that and possibly why, it makes it even more, 100 times worse. So these two brothers survived the October 7th atrocities. Right. As you say, they helped people. They were described as heroes. They were described as heroes. They helped people. They saved lives mm. at the Nova Music Festival. Yes. And they're being talked to by the police. And you know what's really shameful? They were invited here by the Jewish Representative Council in Manchester. Yeah. And they say now they, wouldn't, they don't really want to come back to right. the UK. They say this wasn't just regular anti-Semitism, which they would have put up with. This was anti-Semitism from our police. Mm. It's utterly shameful. Mm. We should, you know, I mean, the Border Force have some serious questions to ask. They really talk do. to anyone like that. But as no. you say, two people, two young brothers who should actually be mm. treated with some respect. They really should. Or at least, very least, um, be treated equally yeah. with everybody the same yeah, way. Course, I mean, you know, course. we've all been through border patrols, I'm sure, in various countries where... They are a bit, a bit jobs stiff, worth. They like to push they, you, you around, know, they, don't they? They're not always terribly welcoming, <laughs> like you see. Sometimes they are. Yeah. But, you know, um, 
it's very rare to get them quite as rude as that. Mm. And, and, I, and I think from, from judging what the two brothers have said mm. in their interviews, you know, it all kicked off when they told them where they were coming from and why they were there. You're not going to do here what you yeah. did in Gaza. Right. What on earth do they mean by that? Exactly. And when they said to them, you know, we survived the October the 7th massacre, we've come here to tell our stories, they say that's when these characters turned on them and started to come to become... And if you're letting them in, as he said, well, we're letting you in anyway, so you just have to let us do our checks. Well, I've never heard of that. Mm. You've let people in, you stamp the passport, you yeah. let them in. Yeah. You don't then go, I'm going to put you in a room for two hours and keep you waiting and ask you all sorts of ridiculous questions about what you're going to do. No, exactly. And as it's I say, they were invited here by the Jewish no. Representative Council to talk about their experiences. Yeah. And we, we, we also know, as I said earlier when I was doing Taking the Mic, you know, what we know about the border force is that they're incredibly bad at yeah. interrogating people who come here illegally. Exactly. Because not only do they just give them a blanket and pass them on to the next bit, um, they actually actively go and rescue them in the channel when they don't need rescuing. I think that's what makes it even worse. They've yeah. brought in plenty of people who shouldn't be in this country yeah. and then two people who we should be welcoming uh, are, you know, treated like... Well, lesser citizens. Yes, and it brings us back. You, we were talking about this yesterday, uh, as I'm sure you have been on uh, on other shows. Um, you know, this report by Sarah Khan, yeah. Dame Sarah Khan, about extremism and yeah. you know how the need is in this country now to kind of to stop all of this hatred that seems yeah. to be going on. But I wonder if it hasn't gone too far already. Yeah, but I think the problem is once we start inventing all these non-crime mm. hate crimes and everybody too terrified to say anything. I mean, you barely bear open your Bear, dare open your mouth yeah. for, for, for fear of offending one person. Everything's become so polarised. I hate discussing, mm. for example, transgender issues. Yeah, yeah. Because you know you're just going it's to get... It's not worth it, is it? You know, vitriolic yeah. abuse. Not, not, just, not just people agreeing to disagree mm. or having an open debate. There's no nuance. Yeah. Everything has to be black or white. You're yeah. either left or white. You're either rabidly extremist this yeah. or you're, a, you know, a Corbynite. It's yes. just... But surely so what we should be able to agree on, though, is if you work for the public sector or if you work for, you know, a front-facing department of government, you must be completely neutral. I don't care what you do in your private life. Yeah. You can go home and slaughter a dozen goats if you want every night. You know, but when you turn up at Manchester Airport, yeah. you must treat everybody equally and fairly. You should, exactly, especially with if you're your border force, you're the police, yeah. you know, you, you, exactly. Yeah. And this is... And I would say you're in the Home Office as well. I mean, because the other thing we know about the border force, as I said, is that their union took part in a lawsuit, sued the government because they didn't agree with their policy in Rwanda. Yeah, but I think this you is know. really alarming when you start, yeah. when they become that partisan, mm. when their job is literally to assess everybody on their entry requirements, right. on, you know, checking their passports, checking the... That whether they have a right to be in this mm. country or not. Well, as we know, the Home Office is simply not fit for purpose. No, it really isn't. I mean, are they incompetent or are they just... Is it well, worse I, I than think, that? Well, I think it's a mixture of the two things. Yeah, I mean, I again, to both. go back to the, to the Gender um, Recognition Act and all of that sort of, you know, what they call critical gender uh, stuff or gender-critical views, you know, there's that woman that we highlighted last week, a lawyer, I think, who's being sued yeah. by somebody who works with the Department uh, of Environment, Fisheries and Agriculture um, on the grounds that she said only women can have periods. And you're kind of going... And, and she said that there's a, a whole sort of, you know, phalanx of people, a very small number, mm. inside DEFRA, who are trying to uh, change policy, influence ministers, and sort of push their agenda onto the civil service. It's extraordinary. It is absolute madness. And it just feels Orwellian... Yeah. ..when people are being told that what they can see and what they know and what the fact that women mm. have babies, you know, no, that's not true. You've yes. got to talk about chest feeding and people who are giving birth and all this stuff. I know. I mean, it, it makes a mockery of... It just makes a mockery of political correctness, really. It does. And as you say, you know, you tend to then avoid certain subjects and, and it's only certain subjects that you avoid because they happen to be the loudest complainers, yeah. you know. And the most violent. And it's OK, apparently, to speak to people from Israel like that. Yeah. Um, but it wouldn't be OK, I bet, if it was the other way around. If they were from Palestine... They wouldn't, um, yeah. ...or they were from Gaza, mm. nobody would talk to them like that. Mm. And that's the problem. And, and the irony is that the, the most abuse that you get and the most hatred is always from the left. And then they have their hashtag, yes. be kind. They have of course. Their be kind of course hashtag. they do. Just stop hate is yes. another one that often um, attack me on Twitter. And I often think, wow, it's very, very hateful. Just stop hate. And yet yeah. you never get that. You never get that from people who have, you know, sort of centre right views. But I don't no, know. it's really ridiculous. Let's just go we back to. We have all this fun ahead of us with the, with the next parliament, with the next we government. We do. Yeah, I don't Absolutely. think it's going to get any better. No. But, you know, we shall continue to fight the good fight. Let me just take you back to the, to the situation with Israel at the moment because we have Donald Trump saying that, you know, they need to start, you know, thinking about the effect that what they're doing in Israel and in Gaza is having on sort of world opinion, if you like. Yeah. Also, 
Britain, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm a bit disappointed that they sort of rolled over and went for this ceasefire, yeah. which people in this country have said that yeah. they don't want, yeah. but that they, that they've now said that they want a ceasefire, unconditional ceasefire, no release of hostages. Mm. America refuses to, um, to, to veto it. So Netanyahu, in my view, quite rightly, is, is not happy about it. John McTiernan, believe it or not, I don't know if you saw his tweet today, um, yeah. former Blair advisor and a man who's now a Starmer sort of uh, cheerleader yeah. um, because I think he's been told to be by Peter Mandelson. Um, he says, basically, Labour Party policy has changed world opinion of the United Nations. <clears throat> That's what they're going around saying. And people, in, even in the Labour Party, are going, hang on a minute, even Keir Starmer didn't want an unconditional ceasefire a few months ago. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the further this is the this is the risk. The further we get away from October the seventh, the further to, to me it feels as though the further that shock kind of recedes. And what we're seeing every yes. day is the atrocities going on in Gaza, which we can all agree are terrible. Well, you every, say we see them every day, but I'm not sure we do. I mean, my problem with all of this is that you know we really only have Hamas figures to to go back exactly. on. We were told two weeks ago that there was a famine worse than any famine that anybody had ever mm. seen happening. There isn't a famine. Um, and every time they warn of a famine, there isn't one. And there may well be uh, footage of, of, of children who look as if they're hungry, but there's also footage of, uh, of aid packages being sold in open markets in other parts of Oh, uh, I think of, there's no doubt Gaza. that Hamas are so, responsible you know, for all of this suffering, right. but I do think that conditions there are pretty appalling. I'm sure um, they are appalling, but what I'm saying is, is that it's not helped by the fact that so much of what is reported from inside Gaza yeah. by Hamas-controlled journalists utterly is utterly nons yeah. nonsensical. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, people like the UN fall for it every single time. I know, and you're right, and Netanyahu is looking increasingly isolated, yeah. and it, it, it's... It, I don't know what the solution is. It's just going to um, carry on. I mean, I don't think Israel... I mean, interesting, they're talking to Bill Browder there, talking about, you know, a ceasefire. I said, well, it's interesting the UN's not interested in the ceasefire in Ukraine, yeah. but they're very interested in the ceasefire. And he said, oh, well, Putin doesn't want a ceasefire. Well, neither does Hamas. Yeah, you know, exactly. Where's, where's the equivalency? There isn't any. Exactly. If you know, Hamas were at the, the table, the UN to me is a busted flush. It's yeah. a it's a it's a corrupt body, and it does no use uh, to anywhere in the world that it's ever been involved with. Deeply corrupt. Dreadful, absolutely dreadful. Um, Emma, thank you very much indeed. We will hear more from Emma as she comes back later on, of course, to have a look at more of the big stories of the papers coming up uh, later on. Now, despite the tragic news of the Princess of Wales over her cancer treatment, her popularity with the British public has inspired a new generation of people to take precautions and see if they themselves were at risk. NHS Cancer Checkup web pages and cancer awareness charities had a deluge of visitors, reaching a whopping 373% increase over the weekend. And even in the United States, the Princess's terrible news has prompted cancer doctors and researchers alike to stress that cancer is a risk at any age. Joining me now is Professor Pat Price, co-founder of Catch Up With Cancer. Pat, welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thanks very much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. I mean, I think everybody was pretty shocked at uh, the announcement that came on Friday afternoon. Um, nobody really was expecting it, I don't think, in the way that it was delivered or uh, in, the, in the kind of detail that, uh, that, was, that was given to us. Um, but I suppose you could say that the effect of it has been a positive one. Oh, yes, I think that's right. And you're right, everybody was shocked. This is a woman, healthy, prime of her life, too young, and it has really made people think. The feedback we've had is people are really thinking, gosh, that's near my generation, what's going on here, and reflecting. So it is good for people to think about that. It's great that they're looking at and talking about cancer, and good for her for getting that conversation going, because we mustn't fear cancer, we've got to talk about it. Yes, absolutely right. And, of course, the great um, sort of th first thing that you say to people if they want to get themselves checked out is get yourselves checked out. I mean, how confident are you that if an awful lot of these people do decide to get themselves checked out, they will be indeed be able to. Well, I think a lot of it is obviously we don't want to inundate GPs with things that are, un, un, are not of that ilk. So people are sensible. They know to talk to other people, look online, what are symptoms. And we know that there are two things people can do, well, three things people can do. It's number one, if you're due for any screening or anything like that, go. Women who are sitting there with a breast cancer letter saying, go for your mammogram, pick up the phone, make an appointment. If you've got your bowel cancer kit there and you've been putting off, do it, do it. So that's important. Second thing, there's all the things we should be doing 
25% of cancers are preventable. So I'm afraid it's all the boring stuff, exercise, reduce the alcohol, stop the smoking, reduce the obesity. I know it's terribly boring, but we can all do something about that. And particularly in the younger age group. And the third thing is, is we should go when we've got symptoms that may be important. And there's lots of literature online about that. So things like if we there's blood any we don't expect, coughing up blood, rectal bleeding, passing blood in the water, things like that, that are really thinking, whoa, that's not, that's not right, that's not me. A lump that isn't going away, a pain that's unusual. So there are very specific things. So I think people should be sensible, but there's a lot of things people should do. And certainly going online and finding out information, fantastic. Yes. Is there a bit of a danger about that sometimes though? You go online to the wrong place online and suddenly, you know, people will say to me, whatever you do, don't Google your symptoms because you'll end up, you know, being terrified for your life. Yes, and I know, and I accept actually just, just now over this weekend and everything, people are very sensitive and very worried. But let it calm down. And if there's anything you should be worried about, contact your GB because they want to hear from you. Mm. Remember, the earlier we diagnose cancer, the more treatable it is. So we need to do that. And what about the sort of overall research into cancer? Because, I mean, I'm old enough and ugly enough, I'm afraid, to have known an awful lot of people that have, have died or have, or have survived cancer. You know, loads of people in my, my family, loads of people in, in my friendship group and everything. Um, an awful lot of people as well who've lived very healthy lives who've suddenly found themselves with, with terribly debilitating cancer. So even being healthy isn't always a, a, you know, a guarantee. But how is... A lot of people always ask me, why is it that we know so little about cancer? We know so little about the cause of it uh, and the prevention of it in a way well in some ways we do know quite a lot but it's the sort of there's a, an, an awful lot of it where we don't know the reason like in the princess's case you know there are a lot of people who get cancer thinking ah i didn't smoke i didn't drink i was the right weight all these sort of things no yeah. cancer in the that's just how it is. It's just abnormalities in your DNA that we all need mm. that have just gone wrong. So we do know why, but obviously we can't always predict, but we're getting much better at stratifying people who are at higher risk and actually educating people what they can do. So it is getting better. The main problem now, though, obviously in the UK is the, is the, the cancer waits, though, because actually yeah. if you do get a diagnosis, you have to wait so long for treatment, and that's yeah. that can do, uh, do a lot of the undo a lot of the good that's been done. Right. Yeah, of course, because, I mean, as long as you can identify what you have and if you need to get, the, you know, then seen to by a specialist, that's the bit at the moment I understand that's a hold-up. There's still quite a delay sometimes in getting the referrals as quickly as, as, as they should be gotten. And we still don't have as great an outcome with cancers as, as other countries, do we? No, and it's getting worse. Uh, in January this year, the NHS data showed it was the worst 62 from being referred so having your treatment should be maximum 62 days. These were the worst on record, should be 85%, it was 62%. And there were even in that month in January, 3,000 patients waited over three months yes. for treatment. You know, this is totally unacceptable. It is completely, it is completely a mess. And that's why we're really calling on the government to get a designated cancer plan and get on with it, not keep talking about it, or what a lot of the trouble is, the, the PR given out is that everything's getting better. It's not getting better, it's actually getting worse. Right. So we need to do something about it. People understand this, one in two people get cancer. We've had 600,000 people sign our Catch Up With Cancer campaign on change.org. Mm. You know, people, this really matters to people, yeah. and this is happening every day with people. A thousand people are diagnosed with cancer each day. Yes, I mean, it is an incredibly incredibly dangerous disease and an incredibly debilitating disease not just for those people who get it but just for the families of those people as well and, and absolutely no, and there's and, been lots about talking to children and all this sort of thing it's 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 the diagnosis everybody fears isn't it really? it is it really is and as 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 we've said many times all our hearts go out to to princess yeah. uh, kate and her family of course as well professor pat price thank you very much indeed for talking to us co-founder of catch up with cancer of course and uh, we'll bring you more on that story as and when of course, that it develops. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, we look at the best stories from today with the panel, including why there is a cabbie crisis hitting Britain. See you after this. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk to Blabbing and Eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Now, here at the Republic, we've always been vocal about our dislike of Sadiq's tyrannical ULES tax grab. And joining us in the fight against this kind of eco-nonsense are now taxi drivers in the new forest of all places who say they will go out of business under new plans introduced by their eco-zealot local council. We've sent our very own Talk TV correspondent, Nick Ellaby, to investigate. These donkeys aren't the only thing upsetting drivers in the new forest at the moment. Small taxi firms in Ringwood are worried clean air rule changes planned by the council could see them being run off the road completely. If this rule comes in, what does that mean for you and your business? Well, I think it would be the end of it. It really would. Just not cost effective. Phillips lived in Ringwood all his life, but picked a London cab because it was purpose-built and could take disabled passengers. But the new eco rules would put him out of business. I don't think that a few taxis running around the New Forest are going to make a great deal of difference to the, the environment. New Forest District Council's plan would mean taxis would have to be less than five years old when registered, and from January 2026, drivers won't be able to renew a licence for a taxi that's more than 10 years old, unless it's fully electric. Nicole has several customers who rely on her service, but it would cost the company £400,000 to upgrade. We're going to have to reduce our taxis, which means less people are going to be able to get in and out. Obviously, we've got a disabled vehicle and they uh, rely on us quite a lot to get, to get them from A to B uh, to appointments and not many people are able to do that. It means prioritising the environment will come at a cost to locals with disabilities who most rely on the service. To actually lose another opportunity to get out and, uh, and miss out on your independence, yeah, it, it's, it can only be a bad thing. Local councillors say the changes are to improve air quality and all responses to the plans will be carefully considered. But with rules on new clean air schemes being ironed out right across the country, taxi drivers and passengers here 
We're hoping the council just gets out of the way on this one. Nick Ellaby, Talk TV in the New Forest. I mean, I'm pretty sure the air quality in the New Forest is not, is not that bad, to be honest. It's certainly better than it is in Bromley. Uh, where, of course, the uh, ULES scenario has been uh, going on. But let's get our panel's reaction to that tonight. I'm joined by broadcaster Candice Holdsworth, former Tory advisor Leon M. Raleigh, and journalist Emma Wolfe is back as well. Uh, welcome back to, uh, to you, Emma, and thank you for the two of you for coming in. I mean, every day now there seems to be a different story about, you know, clean air uh, in some part of the country where they've already got probably pretty clean air. I mean, I've been to the New Forest. Ringwood's not the nicest bit of it, has to be said. But, you know, down near Pool there, Dorset, it's all lovely. And now they're saying... You can't drive around in a car because it's run by diesel. Mm. And these people are doing a very good job. I mean, one of the things that, that was uh, in the story that I read about this earlier is there's only apparently two um, electric charge points in Ringwood. Okay. So if you've got ten cabs, you can have a problem. Well, this is the thing. This is the problem with these sort of blanket legal directives yeah. that come down and they don't make sense for individual people in their individual situations. No. It's like what you just said and also... What are the margins like with this business? Yeah, yeah they might be very slim margins. Absolutely. You just cannot afford that extra cost. And a lot of taxi, taxi companies, you'll know this uh, probably, guys, that in, in places like, which are not really rural, but they're kind of, you know, towns, an awful lot of the business is, is paid for by the local authorities because they've got kids who are playing truant being taken to schools in taxis. You know, it's a yeah. massive taxi bill that every local authority has because it's the only way they can guarantee to get them. They take them there and they bring them home. Yeah. So you try and get a taxi in some parts of England, you know, during school time, you can't. Um, so what, are they going to ban them from driving kids to school now? Well, it sounds like it, Mike. I, th I think that the problem is this box ticking, isn't it? They've yeah. got these environmental targets to meet and I think we can all agree that, you know, it's good that we've got clean air, we're breathing clean air, but you've got to do it in the right places, those that yeah, are Yeah, but the air hasn't getting any cleaner if you, if you start banning cars, is it? I mean, the, the people, people will either pay um, to drive in those areas like they do well, in you, London. You're just hitting people in the pocket. The air in, the, I mean, the, the air in, yeah. in, in the ULES area of London is no cleaner. Sadiq Khan's been accused of... of, of you know, messing around with those particular figures. Mm. And I'm sure that by banning, you know, the odd taxi that happens to be diesel, you're not mm. going to improve the air quality. And we're increasingly seeing the toll that electric cars are taking on the yeah. environment as well in terms of sort of road quality. We're increasingly seeing that, that you know, the, the, the talk about the lithium batteries yeah, and all yeah. of that. And also, I mean, these you can't just keep scrapping cars that are maybe a few years old. No. I saw it with my no. mother in, in central London. Had to get rid of a car. So what will that do? Go into landfill right. to buy a new one? It's so wasteful. Yes. That is worse on the environment. But at one than... point, they sent them all to Ukraine, I think. So it's all right for them to have dirty air. Um, as long as, uh, you know, we're on the same planet. Meanwhile, we have many really buses and lorries that. still driving around London and still driving around many cities across the UK, belching out yeah. black smoke. Right. Really, I mean, appalling levels of pollution that you can actually see right yes. there. Why aren't they being reported well, you and look taken at London, off the road? You know, with the congestion, congestion charge, the ULES charge, the congestion is actually worse. There's more cars and buses mm, and vans and taxis than ever. You know, so... But you've had some ridiculous stories, like with the LTNs and yeah. you're finding yeah. buses taking two hours to take a journey that previously took maybe about it's 20 amazing. minutes. Yeah. And you've seen, even on um, even on the left, even in The Guardian, for instance, they've started to become very critical of ULES, yeah. for example, because of it's, it's just very money-grabbing yeah, as of course well. It is. People have been, you know, charged very unfairly. It's been almost impossible to get reimbursed mm. for it. It's a very badly thought through, very badly run scheme. Yes, the best news I had was this week when uh, it turns out that a lot of the anti ulos campaigners have now started putting bat boxes up on top of where the cameras are um, once the cameras have been taken down so they can't be interfered with because, of course, bat boxes are, oh, that is, you know, that is environmentally brilliant. very friendly. That is smart. Very smart indeed. Now, I'm going to move you on um, to something that just came into us. Um, I just saw a tweet about it. I'm not watching the game, obviously, but England playing Belgium tonight. Um, we had the controversy last week of the cross, which was not the cross of St George, because Nike had decided to playfully mess around with it uh, in a way which upset a lot of people. Apparently, they've come out, England, for the second half without any names on the back of their shirts uh, in a tribute to raise awareness for dementia. Um, and there we are. So I don't know who number 10 is. It's not because I've forgotten his name. It's because he doesn't have one on there. <laughs> hey? What the hell well, is going on? Because you have dementia. Yeah, I... I may have it dementia, or maybe I just can't read the, the name. I like it. I think I think this is I think this is a good campaign because if you're watching the game yeah. and maybe you think actually I've been forgetting my family members' names recently. Yeah. And they talk about dementia, as we're talking about dementia here on this programme. Well, so you can discover you've got dementia by watching a football match. You might think, Mike, you might think, ah, perhaps it's dementia I've got and well, I might go and get myself it? seen by a GP so they well, can they can't mitigate. Do for you. But they can mitigate and they can manage no, they it. Can't. They can't cure it. Really. Good they can't 
effort, doing? Leon. Good effort to yeah, try and support nice. this one. Okay, yeah, good look, try. Yeah. There are many, it's a, it's a no many from me. ways yeah, in which we should be talking about dementia and yeah. raising the issue and, you know, helping people and getting better treatment for people yeah. and support. But this, this gimmick nonsense I mean, it's from not, the it's footballers not who are constantly it's, trying to get involved in this. Defending me. It's just not even sport. defending me. It also sport. makes people laugh as well, and that's the thing. Yeah. Is that what well, you're trying to do? Well, his defensive, it made me laugh. I mean, I never... <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're also losing. I mean, England, they lost to Brazil 1 yeah. 0 with their, with their new kit. Uh, they're now losing to Belgium. With well, thank about you for the sports update, go. Mike. It's there not you a go. Problem. We do new everything career. here. Better, <laughs> probably. Um, and so it's not helping the football team. Again, the problem well, with this country, right? How to no, play. the problem with this country because is the organisations have forgotten what they're for. Yeah. England are a football yeah, team. Agree with they're that. not about remind, reminding me about the bleeding cross of St. George or whether it's Gay Pride Week or whether I've got dementia. Just win the games, go win the Euros, and then maybe we'll listen to you. Well, it's a distraction. I think you're quite right. All this stuff... You see all this stuff, taking not the dementia, knee, getting involved in all easy, this, is a distraction. T taking the knee, the, the St George's Cross uh, fiasco, yes. is a distraction from the players who need to focus on winning football games. Yeah. That's what they're paid very handsomely to And the police need to, to focus do. on catching the robbers and stop dancing around in the exactly. streets with quite the right. rainbow flags quite on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Quite yeah, right. Today they've been dancing around uh, in Swindon. I don't think we probably... Uh, for, for, for the Holy Festival, which is a Hindu festival, I believe. Um, it's come smack in the middle of Ramadan. I don't know how they managed to get that one past the diversity unit. You know, is it all right to go and do an Indian festival because there's Ramadan over here? I don't know what to do. Well, what are those guys over there stealing your car? Mm. Yeah. You know. Mm. Anyway, let's talk about um, Nicola Sturgeon's sister. I don't know whether you saw this today. Yes. Nicola Sturgeon's sister um, is a woman by the name of Gillian Sturgeon. Um, she decided for no apparent reason, to release early. And nobody said how she knew, but to release at about half past five on Friday. Um, so sort of best wishes uh, for uh, the Princess of Wales. Sorry to hear about the illness, blah de blah de blah You can only assume that she knew something because perhaps Nicola Sturgeon had mm. told her. I've no idea. But she got attacked, as you can imagine, because she told everybody something that they weren't supposed to know, mm. almost breaking breaking embargo. But here's how she defended herself um, today. I am just about done. How do you think the royal family will feel? Are you serious? Are you really, really serious? I'm quite sure the royal family are really devastated about the diagnosis, but I'm quite sure they don't even know about my Facebook post, OK? I think they're probably more concerned about the conspiracy theorists like yourself that don't believe it's real, that believe it's all fake. Hmm. Charming um, lady. <laughs> very charming, yeah. And she also went on to say that she works online and she's an online marketer and so actually at the end of the day all publicity is good publicity so she doesn't really care. She she, this woman is loathsome. She's worse than her big sister, she Nicola. Is. I know. Right? She and that's said, saying something. She said, it's all good. The hate mail has upped my has built up my algorithm. And these sales, she makes this, um, she makes gluten-free weight control pills. Yeah. And she said sales of her gluten-free weight control pills have gone up, so it's all good. That's fine. And we're talking about a woman who's I been know. diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. who's opened up, who's been relentlessly bullied yeah. into telling us exactly what's wrong with her. Mm. I mean, everybody, you know, it's really, classless. this woman. It's, it's not classless. about her, it's about... Right. You know, yeah. it's about it is amazing, isn't it, how things sales. like what happened with the royal family over the past month or so... Uh, reveals about people, yeah. you know, and how they actually behave mm. in a place where they're not really given... They're pretty much given free reign to say whatever they want. Mm. It's and you can see what people are like. It's such a clash between different cultures as well. That's sort of, you know, Kate Middleton embodies the values of restraint and discretion yeah. and privacy. And then you've got the complete oversharers the like that. Yeah. I mean, people who She's just awful. embody all the worst traits of online creator yes. culture. Mm. But anything, they'll do anything for attention. Yeah. And they have no concept whatsoever of privacy. No. And this is what happened uh, in a big way in America, isn't it? Because a lot of these celebrities kind of jumped on the banner because they thought, <clears> oh, we could get a lot of attention by mm. talking about this. Well, it's the worst of social media, isn't it? It is, and it reminds me a little bit of... of do you remember the beginning of the pandemic when all these celebrities filmed some cringeworthy <laughs> no. video about... Imagine... James Corden, remember yeah. him? Yeah, yeah. I mean, When it... he did, like, a sort of musical special on get yourself vaccinated yeah, because and... we can all get out and be free again. They try and... <laughs> I'm they like, try and make... sorry? 
They try and make these big things all about them. Yes. And yeah. I just think there's someone else yeah. at play here that's got a far bigger problem on their hands than selling their gluten-free weight yeah. control pills, yeah. whatever it might be. Oh, I know. When this poor woman's been diagnosed with, with cancer. Yeah. It, it is just classless. Yeah, bad news. Uh, the Princess of Wales has got cancer. Great news. I, my sales are up on exactly. my gluten-free, yes. you know, weight loss pills. But I think that's, that's hideous. It's what it's about. I mean, I think people noticed that pattern in the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial. Yes. Where suddenly complete nobodies who'd had no interaction on their social media channels were suddenly doing huge yeah. numbers, commenting right. very ignorantly on the case. Yes. And people learn that they can make a profile for themselves mm. off the back of these big, right. big stories and peddling all kinds of, like, unscrupulous And a lot of life. this is fed into the Meghan Markle kind of, you know, whirlwind scenario as well, hasn't it? Because you've now got these kind of teams of people who are either against the Princess of Wales or for her, and you're kind of going... It's not a football match. You, no. know? you don't have to be on one side or the other. No, no. I think I think the whole thing throughout this episode of, of what happened with um, Princess of Wales has been really unedifying. Yeah. Because you have seen, like you say, a football match and also just these wild conspiracy theories when ultimately it was obvious from the very start, as, as Candice and I were speaking about before we came on air, it was obvious from the start she was unwell. Yeah. And people didn't give her the space and, and the respect she needed. Serious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly it's right. It's not a soap opera. Let's talk about the BBC. Apparently Tim Davey has listened, uh, not least to talk radio and talk TV, because we've been for a long time saying, you know, you've really got to stop prosecuting people who don't want to pay the BBC TV licence fee because it's scandalous and most of the people that you're going after are vulnerable and probably can't afford it anyway. Um, but apparently they're looking to raise um, the licence fee, but they're also looking to kind of maybe stage it and charge different people different amounts for it. So it's still, as far as I'm concerned, ridiculous that they even have it, but at least it's a step in the right direction. It's interesting, yeah. I mean, how much can you sort of charge a flat fee like that in the age of digital subscriptions? Yeah. And I suppose everyone will get different value out of the BBC. Mm. I mean, some people will watch the whole breadth of programmes, some will maybe only watch a little, some will watch none. So maybe you do need, you know, different options right. for what you do watch, what you like to watch. I think that would make more sense. I mean, the defence by the BBC is always, oh, it only costs something like, what is it, you know, less than 50p a day or something ridiculous, mm. which is fine. Mm. But, I mean, I don't want to pay 50p a day for anything that I'm not involved in. No. You know, you might as well say... You know, you can have, you know, a piece of salmon every day, but as long as you give me a pound. I don't want to see salmon no. every day, you know? No, I, I think the BBC offers a, a great service. I think it's a great product, by and large. And I think Tim Davey and others need to have the courage to say, actually, we can stand alone by effectively privatising and yeah. offering our service to the public and they can pay for what they want to pay for. I think the BBC yeah, but they would... know, though, that, Leon, that they can't do that because they're so bloated. They're so overburdened with people that, that they could never, they could never ever um, uh, compete in in a, in a sort of commercial market. Well, well, I think what I really object to is this is is the is the kind of humongous salaries that they pay that they pay to some of their presenters mm. that the rest of us don't think are talent particularly. Right. I mean, when you've got them paying over a million pounds, and I know there's an argument about oh, but Linux, for example, Linica, oh, but he's not paid out of the license fee money. It's a slightly yeah. different part of the corporation. Right. Yeah. It's absolute nonsense. And secondly, what I really object to, Mike, as someone who does not own a television, has never owned a television, is the fact that every day, and even this morning, for example, I got a threatening letter. Yes. And I can, I can brush it off. I whip them up, throw them in the bin. Yeah. They tell me, we are coming to your property. We have proof that you... They, they, well, they don't phrase it like that, but they say 99% of people who we investigate yeah. are found to be breaking mm. the law. Right. I don't have a television. Right. But if I was an elderly p pensioner... You'd be and I was living alone and I was really, really worried. And the way that the licensing agency pursue people yeah. and bully people and the letters they feel mm, able to send, we are attending your property... I just think, well, it's absolutely yeah. criminal. It shouldn't even be allowed. No, it really shouldn't. And they should have no ability, as, as they do, as the only no, tax they don't have any access which gives to you anybody's an immediate property. prison term if you don't pay it. No other tax has that, no. just, the, just the TV licence. Mm. They should have no ability to, to threaten people and to send bailiffs around for such a small amount of money either. Yeah, yeah I, I really, really object to those tactics, and, and many companies use them, those sort of bullying tactics to get someone to pay. Yeah. And it can have a profound effect on someone, especially... Like you were saying, someone who's elderly, mm. vulnerable, on their own, may start feeling, oh, no, I don't know how to handle this. Yeah. It's a really, so not a good thing to do. Yeah, absolutely right. A couple of points of order I'm going to bring up, because yesterday uh, I raised the point that the Archbishop of Canterbury seems to be a bit allergic to the word Easter, mm. um, hasn't managed to say it at all. He's managed to say Holy Week a couple of times. Um, but yesterday it was apparently the World International Slavery 
Day or something like that. So he put out a tweet about that. He still hasn't mentioned Easter. He's put something out about Holy Week today. So the most important date in the so Christian calendar. So the most calendar. important date in the Christian calendar, yeah. he is yet to mention it, you know. But he he's too make... busy writing massively yeah. long posts on X. Yes, well, this is what I'm saying. I mean, on top of his uh, X posts is the pinned post all about Gaza, mm, yeah. calling for an immediate ceasefire because, of course, you know, that's the most important thing mm. in his world. And he posts an awful lot about you know, underprivileged people around the world and all of that, and all of that's fine. But you think he'd just give it a mention, mm. Easter. I mean, you know, come on. The reason he's got his platform to yeah. talk about these issues is because he is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, yeah. And last so time I think... checked, Canterbury was in the UK, Indeed. and there's quite a lot of suffering yeah, going yeah. on in this country. Right. And you would think... Probably even in Canterbury you could find yes. a few down, with, down at Luck. People down that at he could maybe people. help, rather than sending yeah. billions to other countries. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. well, well, that... he, well, he should be furthering the, the points of, of and Christianity. You know, I'm not Christian, I'm not religious at all, but I think that if you're the Archbishop of Canterbury, you're so here for one be, reason, if, yeah, are you yeah. not? Which is to, to make sure that, that Christian values and holidays are being upheld. <laughs> exactly so. right. The other point of order, Jolien Moron, one of my favourite sort of ridiculous <laughs> figures of modern times, uh, has lost yet another case because uh, he'd appealed to the charity commissioners to look at the um, uh, Institute for Economic Affairs and their charitable status to say that, you know, because they're, you know, technically, you know, funded by dark money and all this kind of stuff, that they should have their charitable status revoked. And the charity commissioners have said, no, you're fine. <laughs> you just keep going. It's too much <laughs> he's lost, Twitter. He's never won a case it's, in his time it's too as much, a lawyer. He has to get off Twitter. It's too much Twitter. It's he's unbelievable. online brain. He really is unbelievable. He once accused me of libeling him and I said, look, you're a lawyer, you should know the rules of libel. I have not libeled you. Please tell me how you think I've libeled you. And he tried to... I was like, you really need to go back to law school, mate. You know, you've got no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Um, anyway, listen, you're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. In the final section, we'll bring you some of the news uh, from tomorrow's newspapers as well, though. We'll talk about the climate activist buffoons and the Science Museum. It's a new one. They're called Culture Unstained. Oh, dear. See you in a minute. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> <laughs> Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The world of woke. It's Easter week, ladies and gentlemen, and you know what that means. Universities are closing down for about a month so that the hard-working lecturers and their snowflakey students can have some much-deserved time off. And, of course, the same applies to the schools. They only need a fortnight, though, to recharge their batteries. One thing is for sure, the museums will be busy. Not because the little darlings want to improve their knowledge of anything, or even because they want to support the great wealth of heritage that we have in this country and the incredible artefacts that are on show in our magnificent institutions. Don't be so stupid. They're lining up their battle plans precisely so they can screech and scream and unfurl banners about saving the planet, climate change and the awful, horrid big companies that actually make such interesting exhibitions possible. Only last weekend, the British Museum had to be shut down thanks to hundreds of manky protesters barricading themselves across all the entrances. Why? Because they don't like BP sponsoring the place. Oh, yeah, and not only do they produce fossil fuels, they're also complicit in genocide as well. Right, so the Science Museum is gearing up for similar disruption this week as the armchair activists puff themselves up for a full-scale sit-in. Uh, you see, the museum has links to something called the Adani Group, India's biggest operator of coal mines and power stations. And we can't have that, can we? I mean, even though they're sponsoring a gallery on the future of power and are actively working on producing some of the biggest solar energy farms in the world, the boss of Adani Green Energy lamented the state of the protest this week, saying that he was focused on finding solutions to climate change instead of just making people cry. Well, quite. I've never had a problem with people finding new sources of energy, as long as they're cheaper and at least as reliable as oil and gas. And as long as we're not being asked to bloody subsidise the green millionaires. So far, they're not doing either. But at least Adani has his feet firmly on the ground and he's trying to work it out instead of throwing a tantrum. The Science Museum said, We recognise that some campaigners have strong views about sponsorship and wish to see wholesale disengagement from entire sectors. Our trustees disagree with that view. Well, long may that common sense approach continue, but if your visit with the kids is disrupted by Just Stop Oil or any of the other groups, you can be assured that new laws will get them locked up. Or maybe not. Today, four protesters were acquitted by a court for their crimes because the prosecution failed to present any evidence against them. Marvellous, isn't it? That is the world of woke. The world of woke. I mean, you have got to wonder whether they want to prosecute these people. You know, they actually now give the police powers to protest, uh, to, to arrest protesters. They tell them they can charge them. They tell them they can pursue them in the courts. And then they get to court and the prosecution basically doesn't turn up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something is afoot. It's such an issue. And, and on that story as well, where they're protesting who's sponsoring an exhibition... Adani, and, yeah. ..and a museum, we need businesses to be exactly. phil phil philanthropic about the arts. We're desperate Otherwise, for it. Otherwise, it's down to us to pay for it. Yes, and, you, and it's very expensive, actually, you know, especially if you've got to um, ship artworks across countries yeah. and things like that. That costs a lot. Right. So it's great that business in this country and abroad wants to put their hand in their pocket and, of course. and, and fund this. Right. But they'll just destroy it, like they destroy every other part right. of civilization. While screaming. Absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Shall we talk about Prince Harry and... Uh, I don't know whether it's P. Diddy anymore or just Diddy. P. Diddy. It's P. Um, it used to be P. Sean Diddy. Sean Diddy Coombs. Sean Diddy Coombs. He's got a lot of names, name. this guy, but he's in a yeah. bit of trouble, it would seem, over And his America. lawyer, Lil Wad. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wad somebody or other. He's yeah. called Lil Wad. They all have to be like Lil Wad. <laughs> yeah. Mike, Mike, little Mike Graham or yeah. Mike, big Mike Graham or whatever. Mikey G. <laughs> I'll some be Emma G, the wolf. Yeah. Wolf or the wolf I don't know what. Good, yeah. Leon the Emerald. The bare bones of the story, which everybody's been getting excited about all day today, is that. P. Diddy was, had his houses raided in Miami and I think in LA at the same time by the FBI. Quite serious tanks turned up. I mean, it's one of those things turned up wow. outside your house. You'd be going, oh. FBI um, swarming all yeah. over his property. And there's court papers in which, I mean, and obviously on Twitter they're making these kind of uh, sort of comparisons that, a bit like Prince Andrew and Epstein, you know, here's P. Diddy, who's being done for sex trafficking, mm. um, talking about his friendship with Prince Harry. And, you know, it goes back quite a long way. Yeah, I mean, his lawyer is saying that um, he's got he's got links with many kind of um, ce celebrities, including the royal family's yes. Prince Harry. Um, the thing is, there are photos of Prince Harry with P. Diddy. Right. 
or Dinny or whatever we're calling him. But they're also, and, and they're sort of zoomed in, but if you draw away, there's also William is yes. in the frame. So, I mean, it's not surprising that Harry wanted in the past and probably still does, wants to kind of rub yeah. shoulders with the rich and well, famous those and hang out with these guys. Are but I don't, think any, I don't think there's any suggestion, really, although they're trying. Well, there's no because, suggestion, but... That he went to the... Because he was having these big sex trafficking parties. Right. I don't think Harry was actually at those. We or... don't think he was. However, the reason those pictures have emerged is because... Yeah. Diddy was at some kind of Princess Diana memorial concert yep. wearing a Princess Diana shirt. Mm -hmm. He also had a couple of people have unearthed some, some, some tweets that he put out, one of which was um, some time after that, saying he was looking forward to coming to London, hoping to catch up with his good mate Prince Harry. I want him to take me to some of those Chelsea clubs. This and is... you're kind of going, oh, really? Yeah, I think there's a problem, isn't there? Because people like Prince Harry want to be associated with these types of yeah. people, and then suddenly their reputation gets tanked, and, oh, actually, nothing to do with me. I wasn't yeah. friends with them, really. I never saw anything. Yeah. I never saw anything. Right. Especially so... in the wake of Andrew, oops, Epstein, yeah. kind of, you yeah. know, that whole thing. It's not It's not a good look at all. No, it really isn't. But right. we should say that Diddy... Diddy has not been charged with anything. Did he or that not? This, you know, we can't do trial by social media or even trial by the Independent Republic. No, we can't, but we can... We Everybody can certainly, thinks he's a wrong one, but, but we, we can't... Can certainly, yeah, but we yeah. can certainly suggest that if he's being investigated by the FBI for sex trafficking and three different women have separately complained about the way they were treated by him, you know, that is not, there's, that is not nothing. I think we can say that. Mm. Um, let's talk about Alan Titchmarsh's trousers <laughs> instead. <laughs> Love um, apparently, the North Koreans don't like jeans. And um, <laughs> the thing that I'm amazed more by this than anything is that they like Alan Titchmarsh. I, I can't Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. I mean, the things you don't think you would see if you went to North Korean hotels and saw some television. There's Alan Titchmarsh. Yeah. It is such a weird world out there. Yeah. It really is. I mean, it is the last outpost of Sovietism in yes. the world. Because the Soviet Union, they didn't really like no, jeans the, either. No. They what weren't about banned. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> a little bit before his time. <laughs> jeans are seen in North Korea. Jeans are seen as a symbol of Western imperialism mm. and they're banned. Yeah. I love it. Which I mean, it's makes the only me time... feel like quite a renegade. It's like, now time, when you yeah. wear your jeans, you're not being lazy. You're actually, you know, you're... Stick, stick it's the only the time since I was a student, I think, that I've been able to use the phrase the running dogs of imperialism uh, <laughs> on this particular show, yeah. which is what China used to call them, wasn't it? I mean, yes. it's absolutely amazing. It's cancel culture gone mad, yes. isn't it? We thought we had it bad, and yet the North Koreans are banning Titch Master I'll tell you what, jeans. though, they have got one good idea, and they've edited his show down to 15 minutes instead <laughs> of an hour. That is a good idea. Now, that, so we should bring that guy straight away to Britain and put him to work in the he feels quite cool. He said, he, yeah. you know, this has done wonders for a street cred. I'm sure it has. Mm. Now, talking, we were talking about BBC licence fee. Um, the Sun have got the version of the story here on page 10. Wealthier TV viewers could face paying more to watch the BBC under a licence fee shake-up. So that's, that's their take on it. So it's going to be a sliding scale. Oh, I don't know so if that will So once again, if you're unemployed, you can watch it for free. And if you actually do something with your life... You have to pay a thousand pounds a year. Or something. Here's an idea. How about the people who watch it more should pay more? Yeah. Rather than basing well, it pay on, as you on go. what you earn. Well, exactly. yeah. Pay as you go. Yeah. Be, that's what they're it. terrified of is the minute you make it sort of opt in and you have to start saying, mm. "I watch this, but I don't watch that." No one is going to pay at all. No. You know, they just. Well, I think want they to will, though. It. I genuinely think that enough people like well, the BBC the people. that they will pay for it if they went to that type of model. I think they need to have the guts to actually say, "Well, here we go." You know, pay pay for us if you want to watch. Yeah. This. I mean, I don't want to pay for BBC Radio Shropshire, for example, so... But I didn't mind paying people maybe... people in Shropshire might. They so might. they can pay for it. Yeah, exactly. It. Yeah. But that's up to them. Yeah. You know, one yeah. man and a, a cow. Or I know some people who really like the music documentaries because they do do BBC very high-quality... BBC Four high quality... does a lot of good stuff. Yes. BBC you know. politics documentaries are very, very good sometimes. Yeah. You know, the the long-form yeah. stuff. So... I'd, I'd offer them about 50p um, a millennia for question time. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know. have that as part of my package, I don't think. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> now, um, the hellish trail of murder and drugs binding England to Albania is a big piece we, worth reading in The Sun, page 28. Tit for tat revenge killings blighting both countries. An awful lot of Albanians in our jails. Um, an awful lot of Albanians being say. sent back to Albania, but still... They run the drugs businesses in this country, and it's a, it's a shocking story. Go, going to Albania was the most terrifying experience of my life. Was it? Um, yeah, and, and, and our country or our jails are full of Albanian yeah. um, drug dealers. It is dreadful. It Absolutely is. It's fascinating the way they've totally taken over and yeah. usurped it's not just certain Britain, industries. the whole of Europe. I mean, yes. they're running drugs and people all across Europe. And claiming to come here because they're oppressed and terrified of being you yeah. know, gay in their own countries or whatever. No, it's incredible. Ludicrous. Well, listen... Um, Delightful to see you all. Thank you very much indeed. We're out of time again. Uh, that's all from me tonight. You've been watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you to everybody. I'm off uh, to the US of A for a few days. Bit of Easter. Uh, roll a few eggs, that sort of thing. JJ and Siobhi will be with you tomorrow at 8pm. See you later.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. floor.